It is genuinely amazing how often physics can get away with modeling extremely complicated things as particles. As I suspected, what we're seeing here is a human being interacting with a dance particle. Not a very good one either. In this video, I want to discuss an example of this with you. We will be looking at what are essentially sound particles. If you enjoyed this video, then please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. The first thing I'd like us to consider is how physicists deal with light. We know that light is an electromagnetic wave, but we've also seen that light can behave like a particle. This is the basis of the whole wave-particle duality business in quantum mechanics. The point is though that we have solid evidence to suggest that in some scenarios light behaves like a wave and in other scenarios it behaves like a particle. Now a light particle is given a special name. It's called a photon. Let's keep this in mind. And let's consider sound instead. Sound is essentially caused by the jiggling of air particles which results in the transmission of energy from say here to here while the air particles themselves largely stay in the same position as before at least once the disturbance has passed. Now this kind of behavior is seen all over the place. The transfer of energy from one place to another without actually moving the medium through which this energy is transferred is essentially the basis for our study of different kinds of wave. But sound specifically is this kind of disturbance in the air and actually also in other gases and liquids and solids. Basically humans realized that we could hear stuff. We called it sound. Then we attributed it to the movement of air or jiggling of air near our ears. And then we realized that this kind of behavior was also seen in other gases, liquids and solids, and we still continue to call it sound. Anyway, so let's imagine a sound wave now traveling through a solid. Solids are made up of extremely neatly arranged atoms. And this will be helpful to us because studying neatly arranged atoms is much easier than studying randomly distributed air particles, for example. Let's say now that we create a sound wave in this solid that we happen to be studying by, say, compressing one end. The energy that we put into the solid has to go somewhere, and it's actually the bonds between adjacent atoms that help us transmit this energy from one end of the solid to the other. As a very basic approximation, we can treat the bonds between these adjacent atoms as little springs. We can imagine compressing these springs and then they extend again. This allows the energy that we put in to be transmitted through the solid to the other side and the wave that actually carries this energy away is a type of sound wave. Once the disturbance has passed though, all the atoms largely return to their original positions. If we really wanted to study this sound wave in great detail and work out exactly how much compression we needed to move our atoms in a specific way, then we'd have to do some extremely complicated mathematics. One way to do this would be to encode the position, think about the position of each atom, as well as how this position changed over time. And we'd also have to encode something about the bonds between atoms, the little springs, and how stiff those springs are, as well as realistically thinking about non-adjacent bonds as well. So how an atom slightly further away influences the atom that we happen to be looking at. And you can probably see very quickly how even for a small number of atoms, this gets extremely complicated. Imagine how much more complicated it gets when we think about multiple different sound waves traveling through our solid. Multiple different compressions, for example, causing the energy to be transferred through the solid in different directions. When thinking about a particular atom, we'd have to account for how the first wave affected the atom's position, as well as the second wave, and we'd have to get the timings exactly right too. This all is way too tricky, but here's what we can do instead. We can pretend, and this is the key word, we can pretend that each sound wave is a particle moving through our solid. We can ignore the atoms themselves and just think of our sound particle moving through the solid. This way for each wave traveling through our solid, we only have to think about one sound particle rather than lots of different atoms. It makes the whole picture much more simple to think about. Now, realistically, the mathematics is not quite as simple as this diagram is making it look, but it is certainly a lot more simple than considering thousands of atoms, especially in a solid that's realistic in size, even the size of a grain of salt, for example. Now, as we've mentioned before, these sound particles do not actually technically exist. They're just mathematical simplifications of really complicated problems. Therefore, we call these kinds of particles quasi-particles or quasi-particles, depending on how you want to pronounce it. I like to think of them as kind of particles. Kind of particles, but not really, but kind of. 
This is slightly different to the scenario we considered earlier with light, for example. In that situation, we have plenty of evidence to show us that certain behaviors of light simply cannot be explained by a wave model, and a particle model fits much better. Therefore, we have much more cause to believe that light particles do actually exist. But that's not what's going on here in the sound particle case. This is a quasi-particle that we've just sort of made up to make the maths easier. Now, a question for you. Can you guess what we call these sound quasi-particles? Remember how light particles are called photons? Well, we decided to call these sound quasi-particles phonons. Like phone for sound phonon. We've already seen how phonons result in a much simpler picture, even diagrammatically, but they become extremely useful when considering multiple different sound waves traveling through our solid. Now, instead of having to account for the disturbance caused to each atom in our solid by each wave, we just think of multiple phonons interacting with each other. We can even come up with rules to describe how phonons interact with each other that are based on the conservation of momentum, for example. Now, I don't want to get too bogged down in the mathematics and the intricate detail of it all, but my aim is to show you that there are situations in physics where we can massively simplify a difficult scenario by considering quasi-particles. And physicists genuinely do this kind of thing a lot. If you look up a list of quasi-particles, there's a fair few of them. Here's another example. Let's imagine we've got another solid made up of neatly arranged atoms. But this time we'll look at the atoms in a bit more detail. We'll think about the electrons in those atoms surrounding the nucleus of those atoms. This is, of course, a hyper-simplified description of what's actually going on. We haven't even started to think about quantum mechanics, but for now it will do. Now imagine that we heat up our solid thereby giving, say, this particular electron enough energy to escape its energy level. The electron goes off to do its own thing, maybe somewhere else in the solid, and when it does, we're left with a vacancy, a region where an electron used to be. This vacancy can quite easily be filled by another electron from nearby. But when that electron fills the vacancy, it leaves a vacancy behind in its original position. And this process can happen over and over again, with new electrons filling the vacancy each time. Now, we could choose to track this behavior by studying each of the electrons that moves into the vacancy. Or we can make life easier for ourselves, and instead of considering multiple electrons, we could call the vacancy a quasi-particle and just track the movement of the vacancy. This particular type of quasi-particle is known as a hole, and we can study the movement of a hole from here to here to here to here and so on. More information on holes in the description below. So with all of those examples, I hope this gives you a little bit of a glimpse into the world of quasi-particles. Massive mathematical simplifications that successfully model the behaviors that we see in complicated systems without needing the world's best supercomputer to be able to do it. And with all of that being said, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Hit the bell button if you'd like to be notified when I upload, and please do check out my Patreon page if you'd like to support me on there. Thanks very much. Also, a huge thank you to all of you for your wonderful support, and I will see you really soon.